ahead and get started. We're going to be looking at Isaiah 10, verses 1 through 11. Isaiah 10, verses 1 through 11. But before we can do that, we must do what we always do and back up and cover what we talked about last week so we can keep everything in its proper context. Now, last week we covered Isaiah 9, verses 16 through 21. And in those verses, the, the vision that Isaiah has been given by God has shifted to the destruction of the northern kingdom. And why is that? Well, we know that King Pekah and the elders and the prophets of the northern kingdom have embraced idol worship. And what has that done for those Israelites? It's led them astray. I mean, when your leaders are no longer worshiping God, but prefer the idols that a pagan land has brought in, you will lead the people astray. And that's exactly what the leaders were doing in the northern kingdom. And we'll back up, and we've heard this so many times, but I think it's something that we, we need to grasp and understand. When we talk about the northern kingdom, we know that they are ruled by King Pekah. And what was one of the things that God told his people to rely upon him and him alone. So when King Pekah of the northern kingdom was worried about the Assyrian army, which is an extremely powerful army, coming in and, and taking over their land, did King Pekah turn to God? No. He turned to the Syrians. Uh, Pretty much saying, God, you're not good enough. I'm wanting to go with these people over here. I'm going to rely on them and not you. And what ended up happening, not only did they bring the Syrians, Syrians in to protect them, but the Syrians also brought in their, their satanic idols. So this is what the northern kingdom had embraced the idols of a pagan land. But now think about it. You think about everything that God has done for the Israelites. He freed them from slavery. He revealed himself to them. He gave them his laws. He protected them. He provided for them. And he puts up with them. He is patient with his own. Even when they are rebelling against him, even when they are carving false gods with their own hands, the very hands that God has given them, he was patient with them for a time. But church, we understand that even God's patience runs out. And God will not be mocked for God is a jealous God and rightfully so because he has created every single thing and there's going to come a time where his wrath is coming for those who disobey him for, for those who have rejected his commands and when his wrath comes, what we talked about last week, it comes for all who have rejected. The young, the orphaned, the widower, it doesn't matter for everyone who is godless is an evil doer. And for God, there is no discrimination. Not when it comes to your age, whether you're orphaned or you're widowed. His wrath does not discriminate. And church, it does not fade, not until his justice is fully served. And now, let that sink in. God's wrath does not run out. It is a perfect wrath. And it flows with his perfect justice. Now the Israelites, that being the northern kingdom, they've allowed their sin to do what? To consume them. Meaning every aspect of their lives. Because that's what sin 
does. If one does not repent of their sin, place their faith in God, then it will consume them like a wildfire. And that's what had happened in the northern kingdom. It was just spreading. And for those in the northern kingdom, they will answer for their wickedness. And we know how this starts. God is going to send that very army that they were terrified of, the Assyrians, to come into that land to capture, kill, and destroy. But eventually God will not use the foreign army. And why is that? Because the northern kingdom will eventually turn upon themselves. Brother against brother, sister against sister, there will be civil wars left and right. Until they eventually become tired of fighting one another and then they will turn on the southern kingdom. And all of this bloodshed is God's wrath being poured out upon them. Again, this is why I say when it comes to the attributes of God, we must love all of his attributes. Wrath is one of them. And if we're not willing to accept the wrath of God and love his wrath because it is pure justice... And if we think that we can eliminate that and not talk about it because it's so offensive, then we don't want the God of the Bible, which is the one true triune God. But we can't just pick and choose what we like about God and then worship that. We should love his wrath. I'm still waiting on that t-shirt. Now in these upcoming verses... No pressure, no pressure. But in these upcoming verses, I believe that the vision that Isaiah has been given is going to be here pointing towards the northern and the southern kingdom, also known as Israel and Judah. Israel being the northern kingdom, Judah being the southern kingdom. All right, let's dive into Isaiah chapter 10, verse 1. And it's going to start getting, it's going to be uplifting from, from here on, Okay. Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees. See, it's already started. You're feeling better, aren't you? Church, we have to understand that sin had become so rampant that it even infected the courts of both kingdoms. The judges had become corrupt with the promise of power and money. It no longer mattered to them what was right. It no longer mattered to them what the truth was. What was so important to them was what they could get out of each verdict that they rendered. Now we talk about the parallels of the northern and the southern kingdom way back in the time of Isaiah. And you look at our courts today. There's not much of a difference. It continues and says, and the riders who keep riding oppression. Now, what does this mean? It could mean that the laws of God were not being followed when it came to the court's decision. Or it could mean that the judges were interpreting the laws in ways in which they were not meant to be. Whichever way it goes, the bottom line is this. All they were concerned with is how they could line their pockets, how the verdict was going to enrich them. This was the court system during that time. And what were the laws that the courts were supposed to follow? That being God's laws. This was a a theocracy. And what were the people doing? What were the judges doing? What were the leaders doing? They weren't following the laws of God. They didn't want them. Why? Because if they were following them, that's less money and less power. 
for them. But look what happens. Look at verse 2. It says, To turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of the right that widows may be their spoil and that they may make the fatherless their prey. During this time, who was being taken advantage of the most? The needy. They were the ones who would face the brunt of this type of abuse. God has compassion for those who are oppressed and abused. And a true believer has compassion for the very things that God has compassion for. Now notice I said oppressed and abused. The ones who are trying to work, who are trying to provide for their family. But because of this corrupt system that they were under, they were crushed day in and day out by these wicked officials. Notice who this isn't speaking of. That being the lazy, the liars, and the thieves. It is truly speaking of those who were oppressed during that time. And what is it that God commanded? That the leaders, that the judges, that they look out for the poor, the widowers, and the fatherless. Why? Because he knew that they would be the ones that would be taken advantage of. And what were the leaders doing? They weren't looking out for them. They were abusing them. They were the soft targets. And no one was standing for them. That's what was happening in the northern and the southern kingdom. Whatever these people had, the poor had, was being stripped from them. Why is that? Because the leaders of the Israelites and the Judahites were only concerned with themselves. How can they profit off of them? See, they weren't looking out for their neighbors who didn't have what they had. If others were being abused by the system, as long as it didn't affect them, then they would turn a blind eye to the wickedness. But do you know who does not turn a blind eye? And that is God. The all-knowing, the all-seeing, the all-powerful sees every sin that is committed. And again, he is patient, but his patience runs out and he will not be mocked. It tells us in verse 3, Isaiah in this vision, this is what he is going to be speaking to the leaders, the judges, the prophets. But it says, what will you do on the day of punishment and the ruin that will come from afar? He's saying, what are you going to do when God's wrath comes for you? See, the leaders are going to have to answer for their sins. And here we see God giving Isaiah this word to take to them. Why? To offer them a chance to repent, to turn from that sin. They're hearing the words of God come out of Isaiah's mouth. Now what you pray happens is that these very leaders, when they hear the words that are coming from Isaiah's mouth, they start to look at themselves. Well, was I one of the ones who was taking advantage of the poor, of the oppressed? Or was I one who knew what was taking place as a leader but did nothing about it? Either way, they need to repent and turn from those sins, turn from that wickedness. And you pray that it's then that the leader says, I did, I, I took advantage of them. Or, or I just stood by and did absolutely nothing. See, this is what the words of God, this is what it does. It convicts a true believer. It, it highlights their sin. 
to where they can see it and they know that God hates that sin and they can turn from it. And it's then by way of God working through them that they are matured, that they are sanctified, that they love the things that God loves and they hate the things that, they, that He hates and they're able to turn from their wickedness. But if they refuse this word from Isaiah, then they will be held accountable for their sins. And if those leaders, those judges, those prophets do not repent, then on that day, look at what Isaiah says. He says, to whom will you flee for help? Meaning, who is going to take you in? You you were the abuser. Who is going to protect you? You you think you're going to be able to turn to the other wicked leaders? You, You think they're going to take you in? No, because judgment is coming for them as well. So what do you do, oh leader? Not only what are you going to do, but the very thing that you took from the people that you abused, what are you going to do with it? And it says, and where will you leave your wealth? Meaning as you flee from God, guess what? It's not coming with you. You can't take that which you have stolen, the very thing that you have idolized. It's going to do you absolutely no good on that day. And it's then the realization should start to sink in. That God is coming for the sinner, whether they are rich or poor. They may have had all the money in the world during that time, but it's not going to do them any good on the day of judgment. That doesn't matter to God. Look at verse 4. It says... Speaking of these leaders, nothing remains but to crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. The very people that the leader stole from is who they're going to be crouching beside on that day of judgment. The very people they abused, here they are lying beside them. That's if they're taken captive. And if they're not taken captive, then on that day of judgment, they will be killed. And that killing is not God's grace and mercy upon them. No, that killing is placing them in the realm of eternal judgment. So it's here we see that it doesn't matter whether one is rich or poor, whether they're in the northern or the southern kingdom, if they are leaders who are wicked and wretched and have rebelled against God, his wrath is coming. And then we see this. It says, for all this his anger has not turned away and his hand is still stretched out still. Do we recall this from last week and what this means? That God's wrath doesn't cease, that his hand is not going to get tired. And this is speaking of after the kingdoms had been conquered. God's wrath was still going to be poured out upon the captives. For the Judahites, it would be 70 years after their land was conquered before God's wrath would be pulled from them. And as far as Israel, the northern kingdom, well, they'll never fully return to being a nation again. 
But what happens to the tool in which God used to bring his wrath upon the northern and southern kingdom, that being Assyria? Well, we're about to find out. And I know what you're thinking. Well, I was just wondering that. Well, what's going to happen to the Assyrians? All right, look at verse 5. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Now remember what this is all about. The northern kingdom sides with Syria to protect them from Assyria. The, the southern kingdom finds out that the northern kingdom and Syria are going to try and remove King Ahaz, the king over the southern kingdom. So what does King Ahaz do? He partners with Assyria. And because the northern and the southern kingdom again partnered with pagan lands, God used Assyria to conquer both of them. Now, stay with me as we kind of, wor- not kind of, we're going to work our way through this, but look at what it says here. Woe to Assyria, the, the rod of my anger. Now, we've said this before, and we're going to say it again. Assyria is a wicked, God-hating, powerful army. Perfectly clear, right? Assyria wanted to dominate the northern kingdom. That was their choice. That's what they wanted to do. They also wanted to turn on the very kingdom, that being the southern kingdom, that partnered with them. That's what they wanted to do. That was the choice that they made. But it is God who is using this wicked army to bring about his wrath. Now, when did God decide this? When the northern and southern kingdom started rebelling against him? He's thinking, oh, I got a great idea. I'm going to use them as the tool to pour out my wrath. That's what I'll do. No, before the world was even created, this plan was already made. That God would use the wicked on his own people. Did God make the Assyrians wicked and evil? No. That's who they were in their own fallen nature. That is what they wanted to do. That is the choice that they made. Did they ever choose God? Did they ever repent for what they did to the northern and the southern kingdoms? No. Now look at verse 6. Against a godless nation I send him. And against the people of my wrath I command him to take spoil and seize plunder and to tread them down like the mirror of of the streets. God is telling the Israelites through his prophet Isaiah that his very own have become a godless nation. Again, these are the very people that God has revealed himself to, given his laws to. They have rejected him as a whole. One of the things that we tend to do when when we look at Assyria and we see just their paganness, their, their false idols, and we look at them and we talk about how wicked they are. But, but do you know who's more wicked than the Assyrians? The Israelites and the Judahites. And why is that? Because they have been given the truth. God has shown himself to them, not only physically, but through his prophets, through his words. And what did they do? They said, no, 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 thanks, God. We've got this covered. The, the Assyrians didn't have that. I mean, they had the general revelation of God just looking outside, looking in a mirror. They see themselves and they know that this is some random chance that all this was created. 
But truly, who is more wicked, the Assyrians or the Israelites and the Judahites, who have had the truth and they said no? And it's here we're told that yes, of course, the Assyrians in their own fallen nature wanted to do exactly what I said, to spoil and plunder. And yet at the same time, they've done exactly what God has ordained them to do. Which brings us to the question that has been asked numerous times. Well, then how can they be held responsible if God had ordained them to do it? It's really quite simple. Because they chose to. It is what they wanted to do. Nowhere in Scripture will you see Michael, the archangel, with a non-millimeter pointed to the wicked person's head, making them do something. No. The wicked want to do what the wicked want. And yet at the same time, God has ordained all things. Don't, Don't see this as something that is, and I'm going to use a word that's nowhere in Scripture, but we like to use it quite a lot. It's, don't know why, but we do. But when you look at the free will of man and God and how he predestines all things, what we want to do is say, no, 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 they're, they're enemies and they're fighting one another. But no, they're not. They're working right along with one another. It's not a contradiction. It's a conundrum, but it's not a contradiction. They're not enemies. It's how God works his plan. Now look at verse 7. It says here, but he does not so intend, and his heart does not so think, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations not a few. This is speaking of the Assyrians. It's telling us what it is they want. What their heart desires, and that is wickedness. They want to steal, kill, and destroy. And yet, at the same time, do you know what? They do not see themselves as an instrument of God. They despise God. They believe their battles have been won by their own abilities. But who gives man the power and ability to do what it is that they do? God. The Assyrians were actually servants of God, even though they did not believe in him. Did God cause them to be wicked? No. That was their own doing. That's who man is in their fallen state. Did God ordain them to attack Israel and bring about his judgment? Absolutely. God decreed it, and so they did it. Did God use their wickedness yes is God responsible for their wickedness no did he ordain it yep what we're seeing here is the power of the almighty all powerful God We're seeing a a group, a nation, an army of men who have rejected God, yet are doing exactly what he has ordered them to do. Now it's in this next verse, in verse 8, it's here in this vision that, that Isaiah is going to have the understanding of how the Assyrian king thinks. In verse 8 it says, For he says, 
are not my commanders all kings? What we're seeing is the, the pride and the arrogance of the Assyrians. I mean, they would have never thought they were doing the work of God. But that's what pride does. It makes you feel more important than what you truly are. And for the king of Assyria, the very commanders of his armies had more power and authority than the kings of the regions that they had taken over. That, that's how he views himself. He is so powerful that he is the commander of all the kings. It is here in these next coming verses that the Assyrian king will brag about the cities that he has conquered. For the Assyrians, the king, the, his dominance started in the Euphrates and would continue southward until they would take Samaria, which was just north of the northern kingdom. That's why he says here in verse 9, is not Kalno like Carchemish, is not Hamath like Arpad, is not Samaria like Damascus. See, all of these places the Assyrians had conquered. And they're thinking the northern kingdom will be no different. We've done it before and we'll continue to do it again. So we just see the pride oozing from this king. However, church, had God not ordained the northern kingdom to be conquered by Assyria, it would not have happened. Think about it. This king is the commander of all kings. And yet, if God had not ordained for the northern kingdom to be trampled upon, it never would have taken place. But, but this is how man thinks in their fallen state, that even God cannot compete with them. We see here in verse 10. As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria. Again, this is the thought of the Assyrian king. But this also shows how ignorant he is of the true God. Because the true God, he too thinks, is just a carved image image every place that the Assyrians went and conquered they believed that they were conquering the false gods of that region as well in all the regions that they've overturned there would be images idols of their gods and their temples would stand but the Assyrians would come through and annihilate that so here, the Assyrian king would think that he is going to find the same thing in the northern and the southern kingdoms. That their one true God, which they have rejected, would have images and carved idols. But there would be none of that. Only false gods in the land of the northern and southern kingdom. But no images of the God. And yet the Assyrians would believe that they too would conquer the God of Israel and Judah. Now look at verse 11. It says, Shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols as I have done to Samaria and her images? No. No, that's not going to happen. The only job that they are going to do when it comes to Jerusalem is kill the people and take them captive. But they will not annihilate the God like they have claimed they have done in the other regions. Why? Because it is God who is ruling over the Assyrians. 
God is using them as his tool of justice. But here's the thing that the Assyrians don't understand. That once God has used them to bring his wrath, they will no longer be his tool, but his target. And then they too will have to answer for the wickedness that they have committed against the Israelites. God will not be mocked. Whether you are one of his or against him, his wrath is coming. But church, there is hope. See, for the people hearing this vision from Isaiah, that there is going to be a remnant that hears it and believes what Isaiah is saying. And you will see God's grace and mercy poured out upon that remnant. Did they deserve to be saved? No, they were just as wicked as the others. Do any of them deserve to be saved? No. But that's why we talk about God's grace and mercy. He doesn't have to rescue a single person, but he chose to. Why? Because it was going to be through these people that the Messiah was going to come. And that was a promise that God made and a promise that would have never been broken. So even though this seems extremely dark, God always had his remnant that he was going to rescue. And did they do anything to deserve that rescue? No. Not one thing. And yet God, because of his promise, follows through with his covenant and brings about the Messiah through this group. Questions? Questions? 